welcome to The Sacred. My name is Elizabeth Oldfield, and this is a podcast about the deep values of the people shaping our common life. Journalists, academics, politicians, actors, writers, policy wonks, business people, faith leaders, campaigners, artists, all the people who are feeding into our cultural moment and therefore influencing us and the way we see the world. I want to get behind the positions and the perspectives to the particularity of each person, understand what has shaped them, what their worldview is essentially. It's not something many of us think much about post-education and sometimes even then, but I think it's vital for understanding ourselves, understanding each other and learning to live well alongside people who land in very different places than us, on religion, on politics or on anything else. This week's guest is Sunder Katwala. Sunder is the director of the think tank British Future, which works on immigration and identity and a range of other issues. He was formerly General Secretary of the Fabian Society, which is another uh, think tank, a labour leaning think tank. Before that, he was a journalist and a leader writer for The Observer. We spoke about growing up Irish Catholic, why he's broadly optimistic about the trajectory around race and identity in the UK and why football is so central to who he is. Really hope you enjoy listening. There are some reflections from me at the end. Sunder, knowing a little bit about your childhood, I am intrigued by how this word is going to land with you, but maybe we can get on to that. I would like to know what is sacred to you. And you can take that in any direction you like. doesn't necessarily mean anything religious. It initially started as a question about people's deep values and principles. But people respond very differently when asked to reflect about what's sacred um, in their life. What have they tried to live by? What bubbled up for you? I, I think I did hear it as a as a very religious word. Mm. And I found that quite tricky as mm. well to think about that. I certainly um, grew up in faith, um, rooted in faith, surrounded by faith. And so mm. that, those would be the associations. But I'm also, yeah. I've got a bit of a post-faith relationship with faith that I still recognise the importance of. And I've got, you know, other kind of faiths and identities, mm. um, you know, around me as well. So moving away from that to, you know, ideas, values, and principles, um, it's, it's again, it's relatively tricky to articulate because it's something quite, you know, about fairness, about the way you mm. treat people, and so on, and what 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 that what that ends up meaning as a as a practice or as an ethos. So I think I think fairness becomes quite a quite a relational value as much as an abstract principle because it is the way you treat people around you, um, you know, in your family and your friends and you know in your in your professional career I think you end up having you know relationships over sustained periods of time with people you're doing things with um mm. and that and that that is about you know the kinds of relationships you want to have and the basis on which you on which you have them um, increasingly I think the sort of ethos and principle that I've been increasingly trying to uh operate is is actually about about a good faith engagement with mm. with people who aren't in your group, in mm. your tribe, in your in your team, and you know even to the point of potential naivety, actually seeing how far good faith engage, engagement can get you, and I, I think it can get you a long way and a yeah. surprisingly long way. And so I think the sort of I think that that kind of ethos of a fairness involves treating people in good faith and seeing how you can get on by that is is the mm -hmm. is the thing I've increasingly been interested in trying to do. Interesting. It's making me think of a former guest called Satish Kumar who uh walked from I think from India to the great nuclear capitals of the world with no money and said you know, I, if I assumed people would be kind and hospitable to me, they were kind and hospitable to me and if I assumed that they would be hostile and abusive, they were and like the my naivete paid off that na naivete in some ways can be sort of protective I found it a really challenging to thing to think about and I love that you have been it sounds like you've almost been experimenting with it is that right I think I think you do it naturally um but also in a world of social media and so on you sort of mm. doing it publicly and then sort of people start accusing you of 
doing it too much and then you think am I doing yeah. it too much or is it is it something to do because I mean I've got I've got tribes and groups mm. and so on but I've also become very interested in, in getting outside and beyond them as well yeah. as within them and that this is the only way that you can do that. Yes one of the um, things I was reading about you said Sundar on Twitter is kind of measured and calm and reasonable, which makes them stick out like a sore thumb. And it um, was a, a lovely thing, I think, a lovely testament. And um, let's dig in a bit to where some of this might have come from. What were the big ideas in the air in your childhood? Political, religious, philosophical, probably implicit rather than explicit. What was in your sort of culture? Yeah, because so culture was a complicated idea, I think. I was... I was growing up, I mean, I was born in the north of England, uh, born Yorkshire, but moved to the northwest of England by the time I was five or six. And um, both my parents had come to this country. My dad from India in his mid-twenties, and he'd qualify as a doctor and come here. And my mother from Southern Ireland, um, uh, from Cork, and she was a nurse. And so they'd met. Um, so I was growing up Sunda Katwala, sort of Indian mixed race kid, but I was basically growing up Irish Catholic. And certainly the Irish Catholicism of my mother trumped the Hinduism of my father such that my dad did convert to Catholicism. I think slightly on the, do you want to get married in the car park or get married in the altar kind of offer because he he um, he took us to church. We went to church every Sunday. We went to um Catholic primary school, Catholic secondary school at first. And so he took us to church every Sunday and he was there with us. And if his mother and father um, came to visit, he he would also be at the temple. Or if we were in India, he'd Mm. be at the temple. So he was able to shift between what essentially was a sort of Indian Hindu cultural identity that he didn't give up by becoming a Catholic. And to some extent, I think his Hinduism believed in that being possible, whereas I think on the Catholic sides of things, it was much more that you would have to choose and that, you know, the Katwala children were going to be were going to be Catholic. And I think um, the church, this is Cheshire, Ellswood Cheshire in the Northwest. Um, it's in the Scouse sphere of influence. The Northwest English church is the Irish church. And so the Catholicism is much about the culture of Ireland's not a sort of Irish community as such, but there's that that is the culture. All the of, priests of, are Irish. Of the church. So I was, you know, by the time I was 15 or 16, I was having my doubts about the Catholic church, as you might do um, as a teenager. But I was, I was becoming increasingly keen to sort of declare myself as, as Irish. Because if people sort of think I'm Pakistani, I could give you a little geography lecture and say that's something like me calling you French. You know, don't you yeah, know yeah. your geography? My dad's Indian, but actually, you know, I'm Irish anyway. So what you're British or English or all of these things. So, but by the time you're a teenager, you're interested in so uh, surrounded by faith without noticing it. It's mm. only if you um, say, you know, I wasn't then a Catholic. Uh, school once we moved to the south of England, was living in Essex, and I'm doing sort of A-level literature, and, you know, nobody can spot Bible reference anywhere, and you're thinking, mm. you know, you heathen people, what, you know, why haven't you been taught? Why haven't you been taught anything? So, so when you come out of that kind of world where where sort of faith and the culture that surrounds it is is like the water, that you that you mm. realise maybe maybe it was a bit different to other people's... Yeah, other people uh, swam in different water. ...formative upbringing, yeah. And, the, you know, the Catholic Church, um, and I was an altar boy, um, and, you wow. know, if, I was, if you were the smallest altar boy, you got to carry the baby Jesus to the manger on, you know, midnight mass, you know, with the clanking incense and so on. So there's a sort of majesty of it. I, 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 I you know, I, I, I thought was, I thought was very good. And um, I remember when we were seven, we went to stand on a window ledge and see the Pope coming to Liverpool. There were a million people went out wow. to see the Pope. So that, that was the tribe I, mm. I grew up in. And, and I got confirmed as well. And then I think about a week or two later, I was like, oh, I don't really believe in any of Mm. Or, but I, 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 the 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 way in which the church presented its choices to you about whether you were onside or offside, actually, I couldn't I couldn't stick with actually as a sixteen year old. Mm. Do you remember? This always feels like a very private thing to ask, but prior to that, maybe when you were a child, do you, do you remember having a sense of? religious experience or a sense of God's presence or 
you know, what 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 was before that you then lost a belief in? I think in a way, I think if you have that upbringing, the difference between you know primary school child and a secondary school sort of child and a sixth former and a student is by the time you get to the point where sort of philosophical doubt and scepticism actually might feel really important to sort out and I certainly think by the time I'm 15 16 it's actually quite important and it seems quite you know a a big question I think what's interesting about that kind of upbringing is you believe it in an entirely unskeptical Mm. undoubting way that is actually a very important slightly weighty somewhat scary Mm. kind of thing that the you know these are the you know the, the rules and the codes and so yeah. on and that that's where um in a way i think by the time i'm a teenager i've probably got quite a sort of anglican sensibility mm. in the, a sort of a church with a bit more pluralism in it yeah. would have been quite good but i actually remember when we were getting confirmed and there would be books about this and so on but the, the term sort of cafeteria catholic was kind of presented to you as the kind mm. of pejorative thing you you couldn't and should not be or right. be incredibly arrogant to think that you could pick and choose and doubt and if you're then interested in the history of the church or you know the church in yeah. ireland and you've know, got irish family as well church is going through a very uh difficult time where it's been absolutely socially and culturally dominant and it's yeah. just getting into tons of trouble with yeah. my generation in ireland a church that could you know admit it might not be right about everything yeah. would, have, would have had a lot more space and obviously a lot of people stay in a church by Mm. deciding of course you can be a cafeteria catholic that's actually what most people do most of the time in most western democracies where people are catholic i think the fact that i was told that you know don't don't think you can do that that be incredibly Mm. arrogant was actually the thing that made you think maybe yeah it was quite a black and white choice yeah yeah do you are there things you miss yeah, so I think, and this is why I think, quite seriously, I would have been quite happy to be a sort of Anglican, high church Anglican, not too trendy, an Anglican, because, and you know, this might be a bit pejorative of them, because if you go along to Midnight Mass, you know, sing the hymns, nobody really asks you if you actually believed in it or not. <laughs> actually, that that might be a that that might be quite an attractive offer, or the you know the, the you know the or the sort of you know. The, the ethos of of a particular version of mm. uh, the Christian church, you know, without actually necessarily um, the sort of epistemological claims that it was that it was that it was making. And there, but where the, uh, the Catholic Church, I think, very strongly is saying in this in this era, maybe it softens it. It's really saying, you know, the fact that they're impossible things to believe. That's the point. If you can't mm. believe in possible things, then don't don't sort of stick around and bother. So yeah. in a, in a way, I think the I think you know I think the sort of optics ethos feeling of it I think is is quite a warm and important thing. Mm. I think it really depends which Anglican church you go to. You might <laughs> bet, get a very I different experience. Um, politics has been a big theme in your life. When did you become to come to a kind of consciousness of politics, and and was that around a lot in your childhood? No, it wasn't. It wasn't really. And my dad, a bit like his um, his faith, I think he would, you know, vote for. I, I think a, a doctor said to him, "It's the NHS. Um, we're Labour. We all vote Labour." And then my mum wasn't Labour, so he voted Tory for a bit. And then, you know me and my teenage brother probably switched him back to the left so I think, I think he was doing it sort of swing Quite unusual for an Irish Catholic of that era to be voting conservative for your mum my mum was my mum grew up with the Daily Mail um, oh. she was very for United Ireland where the troops shouldn't be there and certainly on my Irish family side de Valera could do no wrong and the church could do no wrong mm. um, and then and then she was a Thatcherite as well and so by the time I was 15 I was sort of like how does that how's that she did say she said to me Labour put the troops in though and I I went and looked it all up and I said well it's a bit more complicated (laughs) than that but there's a sort of there's a sort of of consistent social conservatism that could make you a sort of uh, um, Thatcherite Fianna Foyle soft Sinn Féin of sorts but it kind of I, I began to wonder if that fascinating if that fitted together because it, this very much is um you know Ireland shouldn't be divided because God drew the God drew the boundaries in mm. the sea and again I'm sort of like oh I've just heard it's a bit more 
complicated than that. Well, you know, I, I went to university, actually. I have very good friends from Northern Ireland. I'd never met anybody from Northern Ireland mm. before. And, and again, you could, you know, feel both sides of that. So, um, But politics was very much secondary to me to sport and identity. So my other, my, my main faith was football. Um, and again, this is this Everton Football Club. So actually the faith, Catholicism and football are very similar. Mm. Um, when I'm seven, my best friend Andrew gets to go to a football match with his brother who sports Liverpool. They watch Liverpool and Everton and I I don't get to go and so I'm just going on for three years to my dad like you know Andrew's been to a game when am I going to game and so I'm just quite naive I think this is sort of yeah. 19 um, 1981 to 1984 so I'm just probably a bit naive about the terrace culture but by the time I'm 10 and 11 yeah. I win this battle and I get to go and I absolutely love it and I'm surrounded yeah. by but my engagement with politics comes through being interested in football interested mm. in cricket and interested in the history of who I am and Catholicism in India and Ireland. You've got to think about the history of this yeah. country because people start saying to you by the time you're a teenager, you know, why are you here? And you've got to find out what the what the answer is. And the answer turns out to be if your parents are Indian and Irish, obviously you're British. That's the most British thing possible. Yeah. What's, you know, what, what's, Satnam what's Sangara your... said to me, you know, we're here yeah. because you were there. And yeah, that what, applies what, what, in both, both places for you. What's your credential? I'm not really Belgian, am I? I mean, what, like, why are you here? I'm yeah. obviously here. You know, you want Indian and Irish people in the NHS. And, you know, so, but I, yeah. I mean, I get there by the time I'm a, I'm a teenager. But what's going on? I mean, I'm, I'm supporting, you know, I, I really love the, atmosphere of a football I start going all the time nobody's got any Asian or mixed pl race players at all and nobody yeah. notices I don't know if I notice that Everton haven't got any black players um, yeah. either but they're one of the late teams to get black players and occasionally right. you play Arsenal Aston Villa they've got four or five black players and you haven't got any and suddenly the atmosphere changes and Liverpool sign um, John Barnes the England star it's the best yeah. black player in England and suddenly the supporters I'm with are chanting Everton or White, Everton or White, to taunt the opposition supporters. So sort of 13, 14 year old Sunder in his tracksuit is starting to think, oh, <laughs> yeah, what's, yeah, what does that what's, mean for me? I'm six or seven years into this. It is an identity. It's a tribe. You know, I'm yeah. supporting them. I'm too far in, but that is a different kind of racism mm. than the kind you get in the primary school ground. So that's my introduction to anti-racism is yeah. racism of that kind of football. This is sort of the year of Hillsborough as well. Fans' movements are starting. There are things to get involved with if you're a 15-year-old. So you're thinking, should I stop or should I stand my ground? And that's yeah. there. And also, my dad is much more interested in cricket than football and he supports yeah. India. India not very good at cricket at this time. They beat the West Indies once. Yeah. So suddenly when I'm 16, Norman Tebbit declares this thing that, you know, if you want to fit in round here, you should support England, not India, about my dad. That wow. feels quite rude. But the big problem for me is I do support England because my dad's yeah. always thought I should support England. And I'm, you know, the Daily Mail's in the house and I'm not not necessarily convinced by it, by it yeah. all. But suddenly my supporting England has become a sort of bit of an endorsement of why Norman Tebbit doesn't like my dad. And so that, that those How kinds confusing. of things involve me in I was just trying to you know watch football and cricket and mm. suddenly you're at the heart of the identity questions of the late um 90s yeah. my very very first political action actually the uh the chairman of Luton Town Football Club is a is a is a is a very strong right-wing conservative MP who's very happy to be the hang and flog em kind of voice and um They've got a plastic pitch, which I disapprove of. They ban all of the away fans. But they're going to introduce a scheme where you have to have an identity card to watch football matches. And so the very first thing I do is I'm hawking around a petition at South End United. So I've moved to Essex, trying to get people to sign the football supporters petition against, you know, having to have an identity card because we're all hooligans. So in a very sort of real way, politics kind of turns up when I'm just yeah, getting sport. on with other stuff um and that, and that you drift into you know a set of identities but, but obviously history identity empire mm. you know race becomes in the sort of, air you know by the time i'm a teenager but i i end up i end up not i, I by the time i'm 18 or 20 the sort of question can people like sunday catwall be british i mean we've won that 
argument if you can't get there it's so your problem. trace trace this for me because you've spoken really eloquently about the changes that happened from your childhood to your 20s did you it, it sounds like when you were quite young it racism felt quite close up is that is that fair and more explicit no, not massively, because, um, you know, actually the sort of naivety of Sunday Catwala is probably pretty well Detective. held up at primary yeah. school age. You know, so Bucks Fizz win the European Eurovision Song Contest and my sisters are making the kind of skirts and pushing me and my brother into it. No one's like Sunday Catwala, the Eurovision Song Contest has got nothing to do with mm. you. It doesn't, that doesn't occur until my mm. teenage years. So it's much more... I think it's much more the sort of over public racism of the culture of the football stadiums yeah. that is very heated. But what's really interesting, so I, I have I end up having two very big positive experiences of social change. One is catching the end of that really terrible period where in a way football and the culture of football is going to be the absolutely worst place in society for inclusion. I see mm. that absolutely transform between when I'm 14 and when I'm 20. Because mm. all sorts of things happen in the culture, um, in the policing, in the law, and so on. But there's a there's an argument going on. You know, once you sign a black player, should you be putting the other players off with racist chants and so on? But there's an yeah. argument going on that where the culture norm shifts, not just not just the policing. And I see that happen. And you know, when by the time I've got a ten year old daughter, and we're off more to watch women's football than mm. men's football. I'll always believe the society transformed itself for the better because I'm just on a completely different planet when yeah. her 10-year-old self, you know, some bad thing might happen or people might be being a bit leery at a tube station or something, but just that that sense which, whereas, you know, when I, when I was a university student and, you know, I remember going to see an England match, there was just a menace in the air. Mm. And yeah. you think if I go down there and go to the game, it'll be fine. If I went into that pub, I bet it'd be horrible. There's a sort yeah. of menace going on around my young adult self, but I'm actually seeing it change. And I'm also involved with people who are talking about how it changes and making yeah. it change. And then I have one other parallel experience to that, which is that I um, you know, go to university. Um, uh, in what the did you study? 90s. I studied uh, politics mainly PP at Oxford, yeah. but 1992 to 95. I'm not. I'm not sure about applying to Oxford. I kind of don't think that. Like you know, cause I've got my Scouse identity now. I'm not sure if Scousers should go to Oxford. Even, sort Some of sort of betrayal. Mixed race Indian Irish people. <laughs> Irish Scouser, yeah. Well, yeah. But like, how's that going to go? Um, <laughs> but I, I go to Jesus College Oxford, which I don't know till I get there. Identifies as Welsh, so I then I, like my main. <laughs> I the did Welsh not know that either. Yeah, not every so Welsh random. Person, every Welsh person, you know, for miles around is there. So I, I've always supported Wales in the Six Nations. And so my main regret now is not being Welsh as a result <laughs> of this, uh, this sort of loss of lack of Welshness. Uh, um, but but um, it's it's absolutely fine. It is not, it is not the most diverse place oxford in the mid 90s uh, my school but also there's a there's a reasonable fringe of you know both international and british asian students there aren't very many black students and it's just it's just not an issue um yeah. for me at all um yeah. if anything people are sort of on the sort of anxious liberal incredibly pro that at least some yeah. of you are here kind yeah. of yeah. kind of kind of argument um but i'm entering a professional world and you know, look back at it now and ethnic diversity in British public life is very, very prominent. There actually mm. isn't any at all. And so, you yeah. know, I'm I'm 13 when we get the first post-war black and Asian MPs, I would have noticed that. But there are six MPs out of 650 when I vote in a general election when I'm 18. And there's never been a black or Asian government minister in this country when mm. I graduate. So if I'm thinking like, if I went into politics, would I be prime minister or something? Um, not yeah. Super. Like it. However optimistic I am about society, it's just not like that isn't a thing that is going to exist. And yeah. so and so again I see and it's it's quite late, it's in this century. Um, but I'm I'm part of a a, a cultural moment when if you're mm. my generation, things are obviously opening up for yeah. people like me if they've got good degrees, as opposed yeah. to if they haven't. Um yeah. and and so that's quite good. And I can't, I can't persuade anybody born in this century of that argument. Because firstly, they're saying, Sunday, you're wanting people to do 
laps of honour because people aren't throwing bananas at football matches, don't you? <laughs> don't you think we can yeah. set the bar a bit higher, which I agree with. And also, like, some presence yeah. isn't, like, isn't what people are looking for. They're looking for absolute quality yesterday. Yeah. And so the higher expectations of people 20, 30 years younger than me are mm. essentially the product of the progress I experienced, but I experienced something they perhaps haven't experienced, which is yeah. that, that you can see and feel the change happening. Getting better. It's so interesting, isn't it? Because we're such story-made story, story made creatures and the story that we think we're living inside is so key for what we feel able to act in and how we understand that what I was listening to, I think it was Catelyn Moran talking about gender. And she said, for the, her generation of men, broadly our generation of men, they had seen some of the terrible misogyny of the kind of 80s and 90s. And so when when feminism kind of, and Me Too came along and various other things m- m- began de- demanding equality and really pushing for it, they were like, yeah, you know, fair enough. <laughs> it's yeah. probably time. Um, but she was talking about teenage boys coming through now who've never lived through anything different, right? Who all they've received are messages about men that are largely negative and messages about women that, you know, girl boss and you can do anything. And and they didn't have anything that come, they didn't connect with what had come before to see it as a corrective. They just see it as a yeah. standard. And so that's why we're seeing this story emerging amongst young men of, you know, it's worse to be, it's worse to be a boy because they're living inside a completely different story than the generation above. And it's it, listening to, reading to you gave me a similar sense of understanding of depending on the ideas that are live in your teens and twenties, you're you're like okay what what is real about the world you know what is true yeah. about the world it can change it can't change it's getting better it's getting worse can get quite fixed um or get, can get fixed in that moment and then can sort of define our personalities do you do you feel forgive me that was a bit of a digression do you feel sort of largely still that you have faith that we are moving forward that kind of things are are getting better and they're getting better probably i think because people come through and go this isn't good enough and get angry and change things but or do you, do you see that? Because the prevailing mood seems to me to be quite, you know, we are in this decline. Is why, um, this is why I wrote the book, really. Firstly, to say um, I'm not writing a book to say, has Britain got a place for people like Sunder Kawala? Because, you know, we sorted that out in now. my head when I was 18. <laughs> so that, that, that's fine. Um, yeah. What I want to know is if I'm an optimist by experience about my society division and how we get mm. through it all, <laughs> why am I the only person? The things that why are the rest of you going mad? It might be Sunday Cat Waller's fault. Maybe my sense of possession of our identity has dispossessed everybody else and the, the older white group yeah. can't handle it. But that would be a shame. Or it might be, you know, but but, but so I, that's that's what interests me about it. I mean, my my eldest daughter, I think, tells me that story about gender change and where the young boys are, but sort of from the opposite perspective as well, that I might be being a little bit optimistic that it always pays itself forward. It's it's clear that mm. what happened on um, race and identity and contact is there's just much closer relationships down two generations than there were two generations before, but unevenly spread. So if you if you grow up in a primary school with with just a norm of diversity and you've navigated it, you haven't adapted to it. And older people, I think, have had to adapt to it. What what interests me, I think, about that gender norm point is that among my sort of wife's family, mostly in sort of Essex, mostly non-graduate, kind of her dad's a builder and so on, um, when they see people in their 30s with kids, they say that they think it's really lovely how much the men can do mm. like have a relationship with the baby with the kid etc and that's good and it's encouraged and it's supported because because it wasn't like that and it would have been nice if it was <laughs> and that that was a new insight for me about that seeing that progress yeah. um if you saw it if you saw and noticed it because this is the group that you know told to go to the pub while the birth is happening and they'll be phoned up when the yeah. baby's born and so the sort of like you know we're not in a generation where you sort of expect a round of applause if you change a nappy. You expect it yeah. to change a nappy. And they're saying there's a emotional warmth between sort of dads and children that mm. was perhaps, A, might not have existed between them and their parents, but might have been relatively difficult for them to yeah. perform given the roles and expectations that they were offered. Yeah. 
It's such a, we're such ridiculous creatures, aren't we? The the things that the the sort of I'm just I'm just thinking how difficult it is for us to hold in our head. Things have hugely changed for the better, and some things still need to change more. You yeah. know that that the 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 both the both things can be true. Just feels like there's not a lot of cognitive space for it, think, particularly in public. There's a different thing that I realised then, because so much of this then turns out to be generational. It's generational in different ways when you're mm. your experience of where you grew up and what education yeah. you had and what experience you have. But what what is really going on between the generations on everything, but maybe especially on issues like race, is yeah. that the same changes have felt very fast and very slow hmm. to different people. And they're definitely fast changes to the to the Essex group that associate and identify with East London and, you know, look in at East London and say it's changed an immense yeah. amount. Um, and they're proud of having adapted to the change and therefore telling them at the end of the changes when we stop being racist in football stadiums and everyone tries to give people a fair chance at jobs and things mm. are more mixed and so on, saying, oh, we haven't even started, made it up, we didn't even try, just feels a bit offensive and yet if you are a young British born person in East London um, you have got more opportunities than your grandparents maybe we're doing quite well but the change has still been a bit slow because mm. we're still talking about wouldn't it be nice if we had equal opportunities when you send in your job you you know you get the right number of interviews well it would be nice but why hasn't it happened and so in a way that that sort of story about sort of change and having to adapt to it just feels a bit kind of behind behind the curve. So I think I think a lot of these cultural identity arguments and who's a woke person, who's a dinosaur, mm. are really about that, you know, what are the expectations of the sort of emerging graduate cohort versus yeah. people a generation, two generations older saying, don't worry, when you're as old as us, you'll work out that you can navigate your way through. And just an impatience about that. Yeah. Yeah, that perspective taking is so difficult, isn't it? Because... The world is what is our, is the view from here. That is, you know, we can only can only so take capable. what comes to us. People are so capable of it. So actually, we have quite big generational rifts in our society because of the progress we've made. Because mm. the progress we've made has been profound across generations and pretty fast, and people have to adapt to it. But people don't think we've got intergenerational rifts because everyone has intergenerational relationships and they just yeah. don't perceive themselves as on the opposite side of their yeah. extended families. And so you end up with um, older people with quite socially conservative views about, you know, how government has handled immigration and whether it's all got a bit woke these days with people working from home and too much EGI. You end up with them telling you stories <laughs> about how their parents were much more racist, but they got on with it. But they're incredibly proud of their children and grandchildren because their children just don't see any of this and get on yeah. with it. And so it's a, in a way a pride in a group of people who've got the views that you're that you're complaining about yeah. people having. And so and so actually people have a lived experience of that of that progress because they will tell you stories in their extended families, you know somebody will have married someone else, someone will have met people across the road, you know, mm. who are Indian. And somebody will have come out, of course, in their yeah. extended family is now allowed to get married. And so everybody tells you their anecdotal stories about how they experience these things. You know, my, my father-in-law, you know, he changed his views about social issues quite a lot because his um, his daughter went to drama college in Edinburgh mm. and he hadn't met people that were gay and then he met people who were sort of very very gay and keen to <laughs> let you know about it and he was fine because they've got names and faces and you yeah. know knows who they are it's part of the theory behind this podcast is that you know i'm very formed by the christian nonviolent tradition and reconciliation and the the kind of adjacent thing about contact theory that basically if you can put an, a, name, a name and a face and a story to someone it's much harder to hate them and so deliberately interviewing people from a wide range of perspectives and just inviting listeners to go, let's let's think about this person as a person before we get to their position. And by the time you get to their position, it's easier to hear because you sort of make, often it sort of makes sense of why they ended up where they are, you know, like the, the life that they've lived and the influences that they've had. And would you put these major changes in society to, really down to that, to contact theory, to the more we the more we mix ourselves up, the easier it is to be 
tolerant or open or curious or empathetic towards people that aren't like us? I think I think there's a big common sense case for that doing a lot of the work. I mean, it's interesting to me that the shift on the shift on sexuality actually starts later and goes faster than the shift mm. on race. And um, there's an advantage once people who are gay feel that they could come out if they wanted to, and maybe they want to, and maybe it's not a massive dilemma. And if you're somebody of faith, you could do it and so on. It's obviously harder for some people than others at different times. But the interesting thing about that is that once once it's a social norm rather than a brave thing to do, it will be distributed absolutely everywhere in society, geographically, mm. by social class, and so on. And so lots of different people will will just have the experience of how did they deal with that as a as a parent or as a uncle as an aunt and you know three quarters of the time at least people deal well with it um contact by um ethnic diversity faith diversity etc is more unevenly distributed mm. by geography and by education so you don't have the same in a way sort of random seeding of it of it everywhere in that the people who are keener on the idea will go and experience more of it and yes. the people who are less keen on the idea will retreat a bit more from it and so actually how we talk about these issues in the media and television matter quite a lot. If you take, say, I don't know, the British Jewish population is 300,000 people, or the black British population is 4% of the mm. population. Um, it's a sixth of people in London, but it's only one in 50 people outside London. So these are people you're going to meet, you know, on the television, um, mm. in good ways or in bad ways, in sport or in news events, more than you're going to meet them in mm. real life. But there's clear, the confidence across the generations is stronger in the areas of high diversity for a long time and yeah. it's difficult it's difficult for an area experiencing its first big moment of diversity and contact that is disruptive and it's quite difficult to be 10 or 15 miles away mm. from from rapid change as well because you're seeing it happen but you haven't got the contact and so if you're looking in at east london or birmingham or so on and feeling it doesn't feel like me anymore you're more worried about it if you're adjacent to it than if you're mm. if you're actually in the in, in the oceans. So I think I think there's a lot of common sense to contact the, but we should then say the contact is unevenly spread and that, you know, yeah. the people who go to university meet, you know, maybe get segregated by class, but mm. they, they're gonna meet people of different geographies. If you're I don't know, if you're Scottish or Welsh and you don't go to university, your experience of like English people might be yeah. much, much less close than than, yeah. than than graduates from those countries. Yeah. Let, we're going to get on to um, British Futures and How to Be a Patriot in, in a minute, but I just want to fill in a bit of your biography because you left university and did, were a journalist for a while on The Observer and other places. And then you were the General Secretary of the Fabian Society. Tell me a bit about that chapter. What drew you there and what were you doing? So, I mean, I come out with my PPE degree, which is a very useful thing to have, wondering what to do in the real world. And I, I, I start in sort of academic book publishing, which is a sort of as the least step you could take into the real world if you're worried about it, but you were leaving the university behind. And then I end up in sort of think tanks and journalism and so on. But I'm not, I mean, I'm not an academic. I wasn't, I wasn't that much of a journalist, really. I was more of a leader, writer and a piner than a sort of, you know, shoe leather kind Reporter, of person yeah. so i'm sort of yeah. i'm on the boundaries of those political think tanks and journalism things and wherever you are i think there's just a grass is always greener effect you know you're you think i was working in a think tank you go and think oh I'd, like if we're always phoning up the journalists telling them what to say why don't i go and write the editorials and then you mm. you know if you're writing the editorials you think oh i'll go and uh Can't have these affect change ideas. I'll, I'll yeah. reshape. I'll reshape the the Fabian Society. So I mean, it, it, it always being on that on that boundary and an element of you know good luck and so on. I mean, the Fabian Society is interesting because you know, it's 120 years old, um, but it's in and around politics. It had this. It is part of a tribe, the left tribe, but it has this incredibly sort of pluralist ethos mm. to it. Mm. So they they print on everything they ever publish. You know, this is the view of the author, not the view of the Fabian Society. The Fabian Society will publish. You know, everything interesting and useful so that that works quite well if you're a kind of um you know relatively skeptical member of the mm. tribes that you're in yes i went to look at the website today and it is a it it's a pleasingly 
uh, it talked about as a socialist society, but believes in gradualism, not violent overthrow or something like that. It was, it was, it was sort of remarkably sounded like we need to, we need to, we need to tell you what we're not which is yeah. not those people that want to bring about revolution. Yes, we're socialists, but we're very reasonable write, ones, yeah. was the they, vibe they, I got. They write the very left-wing constitution mm. of the Labour Party, which basically says nationalise everything, but they write it because of the Russian Revolution, so it's the moderate thing to do. They end up getting enormously duped by Stalin. Actually, sure, the webs get enormously duped by Stalin, partly because they sort of believe if people write things down on constitutions. I was then quite interested in you know what you do with that. They're... They're very influential on sort of post-war India and post-war Pakistan. And so you feel like you should go and sort of apologize for anything that <laughs> didn't work if people sort of, you know, Jinnah and Nehru are both great sort of Fabians. And there's something there's something very positive, I think, about the post-imperial relationship with with India, actually, in mm. how sort of Anglophile that sort of, you know, people are being sent to prison as sort of Fabian Anglophiles because they're just asking for the democracy and free speech that you're banging on. <laughs> About. Yeah. So, yeah, and the, but there is a, there is an issue there where almost the not taking a position is the thing you're proud of. But where the Labour Party, and the, you know, this was I was I was running it in uh, sort of Tony Blair to Gordon Brown times in mm. government. But they feel that they navigated splits in the eighties. You know, they'll think that again in the Corbyn era because they always said we'll share a space, and if you turn up and are yeah. willing to accept that other people have got a view, we'll have a space for dialogue yeah. and debate. And yeah. it was you know. I used to always go and do Liberal Democrat and Labour events. It was the kind of place that approved of that. I remember, I remember Liberal Democrats went into the coalition with the Conservatives and we did it anyway, carried on yeah. doing it. And then at the Labour conference, you have people really sort of, you know, fiercely <gasps> yeah, disapproving yeah, yeah. of the fact that you've done this. But you were saying, well, actually, why wouldn't yeah. we have yeah. some spaces that keep that dialogue open? Yeah, that conversation. So you're at the Fabian Society and then you later went on to set up British Future, both of which are broadly think tanks. Uh, we met because I used to run Theos, which is a think tank. And I the conversation I would have with people who were outside that world about what a think tank is and does, what is it for? What is it... Yeah. Uh, what I, or what was some of the most painful? What is your theory of what a, I guess, in an ideal world, a think tank is adding to our common life? What should it be, what should it be doing in the public conversation? I mean, I mean, there are very different kinds of think tanks, aren't there? There are people who are very expert and very neutral. There are people who are very um, political. British Future also wanted to be a different kind of think tank because I wanted to work out how to reshape the public conversation about the issues that people really find difficult. And then it isn't about the quality of your research as to, you know, what are the unemployment rates about different groups. It's about what drives that, what drives that public conversation. British Future Farm has a very vanilla motherhood and apple pie idea, which is that we'd like a confident, welcoming, inclusive, fair society. And we'd like more people to find that common ground. We'll hooray mm. for us and well done everyone. Um, but why how we will do that is we will find anything that people find difficult, divisive, polarising, we'll find the sharpest edges and see if you can get common ground there. So it was it was very much about talking about immigration to people who were pretty worried about it, sceptical on the fence or against it in mm. a way that could get you somewhere. Um, mm. But And a lot of the other people who thought that something like this should exist were interested in a, a broader conversation about immigration. It became, it became British future because my view was that if you wanted to, to talk about whether it's immigration or race or integration or faith minorities or diversity, then in people's heads, everything is mixed up. You've either got confidence in the future of your society or you haven't. Mm. And we've got mm. to work out whether that's, are there chances for me and my children, whether I'm of the majority of the minority group, or is it, are we still a society anymore if we're changing so fast, or if we're not changing fast enough, that, that you, have to, you have to talk about whatever people want to talk about. And then yeah. ask whether or not whether or not we can find common ground on the places that find it quite difficult. We've got a culture with Britain. We've got a culture that is naturally a bit avoidant and a bit hesitant of mm. difficult issues, and that has a that has a value in it. One of the reasons we've taken some of the heat out of Brexit, unlike what the Americans have done since Trump, is that is that we we haven't liked the experience of ourselves as more polarized, more divided than we thought. 
But yeah, I mean, the British Future was created because, and it was 2012, we're about to have the Olympics, about to have the Jubilee. We're saying, actually, there's a good story to tell about our society, but it's actually quite fragile. It's quite anxious. Yeah. It's quite fragmented if we don't get to those points. How do you shape a public conversation? If you want the conversation for people who are very engaged, you know, engaging in interfaith dialogues or get involved in universities, that's fine. If you want to shape the public conversation, you've got to find the moments, mm. the frames where the identity conversation is on and do yeah. something useful with them. And what have you learnt about where it, it, how it is possible to find common ground on some of these issues that make people most tense? So I get, I get more and more confident the more you, the more you do it, um, uh, because it, and this is this point about good faith, and you can, and we do, you know, we do qualitative things where we just try and get people to talk, and giving people permission to talk about things they're not sure if they can talk about is, you know, mm. a bit of an art form, but people really like it when they yeah. try to do it. I mean, I have a little experiment where we have a discussion with people who think free speech is kind of over being closed down about what that's like, but where they then have to pick the topic and come back, the topic they thought we couldn't do, they have to come back and do it. And then they're like, oh, did we pick trans rights? Why did we pick that? But then so 90 minutes later, having done it, or statues or race, they're like, oh, you know, we should pat ourselves on the back a bit. I wish I could just find someone I really disagreed with about this now because it turns out we're quite... So there's a cathartic reassurance if you let people do it. We don't have a lot of spaces or a lot of confidence mm. to do that. You know, something like um, October the 7th has happened in the Middle East. That's going to affect community relations here. In schools, there'll be people saying, well, you need to protect that boundary. Anti-Semitism needs to not be in this. We need to protect that boundary, anti-Muslim prejudice. But say, while we're protecting the boundaries, should we make sure that people get the space to speak? You, you need quite a lot of confidence to take that on because there's a lot mm. of risk to doing that. So I do get, I do get more confident when we, when we do it. But the problem of the culture we've got is, I think, I think seventy-five percent of people across all groups have a sort of ethos of. They'd like it to be like this. They'd like the politicians to behave better, the internet to calm down. And they will model those behaviours themselves on the bus, on the train, mm. in the street, in the pub, sometimes not saying things that they could have said because they don't want to. But but the public culture is driven by people who've very much got their axe to grind and the very legitimate axes to grind often mm. of, you know, rights and justice from the left or other mm. issues from the right. And, and then everyone else leans out and think so oh, yeah. I think like I'm not sure I'm going to be the you've that both got really uncomfortable you both got half a point about the Israel Palestine debate yeah. but so people know what they would do in the real world but don't know how to translate that into the media and online culture yeah. that is that is one of the problems and your book is called How to Be a Patriot. And one of the things you talk about is or you have spoken about is kind of progressive patriotism and patriotism that can unite and challenging this idea that patriotism is sort of inherently exclusive or excluding. Could you tell me more about how that yeah. idea developed actually, in you? I mean, I'm I'm quite patriotic about my own country. I wouldn't have called it that when I was 15. But actually, one thing British people, especially people from a Commonwealth background who are minorities, whenever they've been rejected, they haven't said, if you reject me, then, you know, sort off anyway, I don't care. They've doubled down on it. The Windrush generation did that. I think British Muslims have done that in this generation. They basically, British minorities said what I say, really, when I'm 15, which is like, if you're asking why I'm here, learn your own history, <laughs> get mm. some patriotism. And actually, there aren't many minority groups in Europe who kind of, who can do that, who have such mm. a stake on the common culture or the mm. historic claim that they can start saying to everyone else, you should know your own history. Obviously, you push it, you push it. <laughs> You can push hmm. it too far. Progressive patriotism, I'm not that keen on as an idea. Okay. I think an inclusive patriotism, because progressive patriotism is a way of saying to the left, watch out, the far right are around. They think they own the flags. Well, frankly, the far right don't own the flags. But if we have the inoculative safe version, it'll be okay because everyone else can have the vaccine. That is progressive patriotism. And you might have you might have very pejoratively cast sort of all normal patriotism that isn't especially progressive about the yeah, Chartists and the level anti-progressive patriotism. Yeah, as, as, being, as being a bit part of the problem until people get the thing. So there's a, there's a different thing, which is the progressives should, if the progressives can find things they're proud of in our history, campaigns for change, suffragettes, and so on, great, let's bring that to the table. Mm. But we, we're trying to respect, I suppose, the conservative traditions of patriotism if they want to accept and include people who want to join them. And mm. I'm finding the way that, you know, at moments of change, we disrupt our own society campaign for its change. And that's, that's part of part of who we are. So I, in a way, I think, I think it's never, it's almost, 
I don't I don't want to hear the left talk about how they can't do it and it's really difficult. So they just try doing it, try and be normal. You know, if you created the National Health Service, you'd be proud of it. If you turn up on Remembrance Sunday, it doesn't belong to the right or the left, mm. actually. Remembrance as a tradition, which is very powerful to people, has actually got a lot softer in an mm. era of modern wars. There's a lot more uh, acknowledgement of the role that women played in wars. Mm. There's been a growing awareness of a true story, which is the armies mm. of the First War and the Second World War. They look more like the 2020s Britain than the yeah. Britain of 1914 or the Britain of 1940. Well, that's surprising. But if mm. you're surprised by that, we well, could find out our history, teach it in the classrooms. Once we've established that's the case, we can then say, okay, it's because of this complicated story about empire decolonization, mm. immigration. But there, there are real facts about how we became who we are. That yeah. How we became who we are is a product of our history, not a sort of betrayal and breach of it. And so the sort of Millennium Dome kind of inclusion which the form progressive tradition is like, it's the future now, let's all get on a spaceship and, you know, <laughs> we're all here and we're all modern, so there is no past, doesn't do what, you know, I think Danny Boyle actually did in the Olympic opening semi I'm trying to do, which is that the, the modernity is a product of the history, you know, can have a civil war and work out that you don't want to do that, but you, you we actually learn the approach we come to take from, from our history. And it's different it's a bit different here than in France as to exactly where we ended up because of how we how how, how we did it. So um if if patriotism becomes too sort of politicized in Scotland on two sides, in Northern Ireland, in you know, around Brexit, um mm. then actually we will lose the ability to do this. But where where Britain's doing a little bit better than America and to some extent mm. France, is America is so deeply divided, not just by politics, but by the way politics interacts with faith and democracy and identity and geography, that if I know a thing about you, the identities all get stacked up. If I know what yeah. you think about climate change, I can guess what you think about abortion. If I know what you think about abortion, I can guess if you've taken the vaccine. And if mm. I see you wearing a face mask, I know how you voted in the presidential election. Mm. We need to not let that happen in a culture yeah. that's got drivers, that's got drivers to to doing that. And Britain actually has got several things, the National Health Service, the remembrance traditions, the sports teams, where you can sort of think, and we saw this a bit in the pandemic, okay, we're all at each other's throats because we have very different views about whether this referendum was a stupid idea or whether you should respect something that people voted for. You've got two totally yeah. parallel narratives of why we're in trouble. People getting yeah. very frustrated. There are lots of moments where you can say it's quite good, isn't it, that that quite big argument doesn't define us entirely. Sunder Cutwell, thank you so much for speaking to me on The Sacred. Thanks very much. Well... Let's just state the obvious thing that Sunder in his very um, presentation is helpful for challenging my cognitive shorthands. You know, when you see someone like Sunder with Sunder's name, and he said this himself, the immediate association you don't have is Irish Catholic. And so uh, it was really lovely to hear about that childhood and that some of the blessings and the complexities of that, his it was such a sweet thing to be like, I really wanted to be Irish, you know, strong identification um, with Ireland because of the tribe that he brought up, he was brought up in, um, in the northeast of England. And again and again, I'm just forced to notice these assumptions that I have uh, and be forced into awareness of my confirmation bias and, and wonder how often I've kind of looked at people as I walk down the street or had my, um, you know, run my name down a list of names, whether it's uh, a name that it seems like the origin is in a different language or a name that's double barreled or um, all these, all these um, short heads and the, these um, shorthands and these uh, associations that we have. And just, I want to be able to be the kind of person who go, just pause a minute, like that's possibly useful data or it's possibly not wait and see, look at the person that's in front of you in all their particularity. Fairness, that's come up a bit this series. Fairness and uh, good faith to the point of naivete. And I really, um, I think there's something profound there about that posture. Uh, expectations matter. I've been writing about this recently when we expect uh, good faith from people, when we expect respect from people, when we expect that people are changeable and persuadable. It's not that we will always be right, but I think we will more often receive that back from them than if we had come uh, with a set of negative associations 
to this. When I interviewed Satish Kumar in our previous series, he said something similar. He went around the world, um, you know, with with nothing, relying on the kindness of strangers and received it. And I did say, to him, you know, this all sounds very motherhood and apple pie. Um, it really sets off my sort of cynicism trigger. But I think it might be true. Um, and I certainly want to experiment with it a bit more myself. It was really interesting listening to Sunder talk about, um, you know, the Catholicism in his childhood and how being given this vision of kind of a certain kind of Catholicism versus none um, was not helpful for him that he was told, you know, you can't be a Catholic. And I think he thought, well, therefore I can't be any kind of Catholic at all. Um, and how often, no matter what kind of tradition you're raised in, uh, I think many people have these moments of thinking, well, okay, now I have questions. I'm trying to work out if this is for me. I'm trying to work out where my place is in this tradition, in this tribe, in this background. And if we're not met with enough grace and patience and empathy and space to work it out for ourselves and ask those questions, um, it's very easy for it to just feel like a place we we, we don't belong anymore, um, as it as happened with Sunder. And I, I pressed him a little bit, and this always feels like nosiness akin to asking about someone's sex life about the internal experience of his religion and he didn't really go there and I think it revealed to me one of my prejudices and presumptions and because my my faith story was began with an ecstatic experience and is very internal and emotional um I sort of project that onto people other people I assume that that's that's true of lots of other people but I think my my faith story was about coming sort of inside building outwards but I think for a lot of people that that, that the, the containers the structures the rituals the rhythm the outside is is the heart of it Charles Moore said this to me various other guests along the years have said this um and it's another way I need to uh ag- acknowledge that my experience is not everyone's experience and it's not that mine is right and other people's are wrong that's what I have to keep saying to myself upsettingly <laughs> uh, I think I will my whole life um, I think Sunder's story is the definition of the person who is political. You know, he is now a uh, politically a political person who's been involved in politics, policy, uh, political journalism his whole life because he loved football and didn't know if he had a place there because of the colour of his skin. And I was really, it was really helpful to hear him narrate that story of I have seen change happen. I have seen change happen in my lifetime around football. I've seen change happen in my lifetime around who is represented in politics. And there's this this week, there's this big spat about race and Rishi Sunak and whether him being PM proves that England's uh, Britain's not racist. And I think there are that there are you know sensible people saying both things. And I wonder. Sunda made me go, I think we probably do need to acknowledge that having a brown skin prime minister wouldn't have happened 20 years ago. And therefore it is progress. And it doesn't mean that racism doesn't exist. Um, again and again, this need to hold together two true things and accept the world in all its complexity. Um, that doesn't actually come at all naturally to us. And I was left thinking about progress and whether it's exactly the rage of a rising generation at the state of the world as they find it that helps us move forward, that Sunder and older generation can go, look how far we've come. Um, yes, we need more change, but look how far we've come. Maybe it's precisely the inability to go. And I don't mean complacent, because I don't think Sunder's complacent at all, but the, the, you know, the, 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 the emphasis on what still needs to change that drives us forward. I'm generally not a very angry person or rage-filled, and I... Um, it's, ch- it's challenging me to think actually maybe it is rage and discontent at the state of the world that helps us be people who can work for justice. Um, and certainly I see that as in line with lots of strands in my tradition. Um, but yeah, m- m- maybe we need both. Maybe we need the sort of elder saying, look how far we've come, change is possible. And um, younger people, either younger in age or in perspective, saying no, there is more. Um, we mentioned contact theory a little bit. Contact theory is just one of those fancy academic names for something that is incredibly common sense intuitively, which is that if we spend time around people from a particular group or tribe or race or language or sexual orientation, whatever it is, we prejudice goes down. We feel less hostile towards them. We 
are less likely to accept misinformation about them. Um, it just allows us to be um, open to them as human beings who we want to live amongst. Um, and Sunday's really interesting point was about sexuality that it's possible that change around changing attitudes around sexuality have happened faster because um, queer people of all stripes are more evenly distributed across the population. Whereas people of colour tend, for lots of historic, economic, social reasons, to be concentrated in urban centres. And therefore, um, more people have someone who is LGBTQI plus in their networks, on average, than maybe uh, white British people have people of colour. That was interesting to me as a thesis. Finally, listening to Sunder, honestly, I was reminded of how much I am part of the problem because sometimes what I wanted to say back to him was, well, Sunder, that's too nuanced. That's too reasonable. Because I, like all of us, am programmed to seek extreme views um, and novelty. My brain is looking for, uh, you know, what's, what, what's something dressed up in a way I've not heard it before? Or, you know, what's, um, yeah, what's extreme? What's spiky? What's sort of standing out um, to me? And Sunder's wisdom is precisely resisting that and saying, like Ben, ben Goldsworthy? Ben Goldsmith. Anyway, there is a famous book about science that says, I think you'll find it's more complicated than that. And I think Sunder's saying that about identity and about immigration and about British values and about patriotism. It's complex. It's nuanced. I want to raise my ability to listen to complex and nuanced things without my brain going off seeking the next tweet, right? Or shiny reel on social media or just something to distract myself. I want to have the attention span to literally attend to the world in all its complexity and all its variousness. You know, that Louis McNeese line from Snow, world is crazy and more of it than we think, incorrigibly plural, just like <laughs> overwhelming. And it, it, it asks something of us, but I think it asks something important of us. Because it's not enemy and friend, right and wrong, black and white. Things are getting better. Things are getting worse. And I want to resist um, needing one simple story. So just help me with that today. I hope he's helped you too. Thank you so much for listening to The Sacred. My name is Elizabeth Oldfield and our production team are Daniel Turner and Fiona Hanscom. We are edited by Drew Hawley and our music is by Luke Stanley. Please go and check out the work of Theos. Uh, the Sacred is a project of the think tank Theos and there's loads of brilliant research and uh, events and commentary going on within the wider team. You can find me on social media, on uh, Twitter and on Instagram. You'll, you'll be able to find me. I also have a substack called morefullyalive.substack.com and I love it when you're in touch. So does the whole team. So reach out to us on social media or on our email. Tell us what you thought, recommend a guest, ask a question. Um, until next time, I look forward to speaking to you then. Mm -hmm.